everybody. Welcome back to uh, Grill At. Everybody, welcome back to Big Al's Grilling ASMR. I'm up here on my roof, as you can see once again, and uh, today. We are doing the old tried and true as we usually do a big old bag of chicken. I haven't really gotten too creative, I'll be real with you. But we're gonna fire this grill up and I'm gonna talk to you about a couple things that are on my mind a little bit right now. And particularly, I would say love bombing is a big one. Um, hold on, I'm actually, I made a list. Love bombing, keeping a routine, uh, beating yourself up, Kamala Harris and career anxiety all of which just things I've been going through in the past week and of course if you if you enjoy the show I would employ you to um, to subscribe and please like the show because uh, I think you'll you'll hopefully resonate with a couple of the things that I'm speaking about so love bombing is when you are too invested in a situationship or a situation with somebody that you're dating at the moment. So maybe not boyfriend, girlfriend yet, but you pour it on a little too thick. Um, you know, too much love, too much compassion. Who that, who the hell would want that? That's what I think. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's not good, I suppose, to do too early, but I'm, I'm trying to make sure I'm kind of like keeping a level, a level and an even keel. I think I do it too early because as a stand-up comedian, I think it's very hard for me sometimes to like turn it off and just kind of be myself and and not just trying to impress people. I'm on stage. My job is being on stage trying to win you over to have you like me, you know, to a certain degree. And uh, I think it's very hard when somebody you really want to impress, like a romantic love interest, and you have to you have to be like, oh, stop. Don't just say things to say things. Say how you feel, because in the long run, you won't be called out on just on just placating somebody's likes and dislikes. Let's see what's going on with this chicken. I think I'm gonna throw the chicken on right now, actually. Oh yeah, you hear that? So realistically, what I what I try and do is make sure that I'm being as honest and open as I can be. I'm gonna tell girls up front pretty honest. I'm gonna be like, hey, I, I can't really turn this off. I'm gonna be this guy. Because I've started seeing somebody who I'm very excited about and I worry that my zeal for her and relationship would turn somebody off. People get the ick very quickly nowadays. It is almost astonishing how quickly we, I'd say, as people in their late 20s, early 30s, um, are ready to cast people aside. I think men especially are, are very wary of dating because of the accessibility that other men might have to somebody who, who we're talking to. And of course, just being a guy who is secure with himself, you shouldn't care, but I think for if you're like growing up with a lot of like with Instagram and with all the social media, it's very easy to to like keep those deep rooted beliefs that like you're gonna be um, usurped or cucked by a man who's uh, who's got a six pack or something like that who does uh, a lot of uh, kettlebell swings on Instagram. But yeah, I'm, I'm dating this girl right now and I really like her. We spent a lot of time together. But I think what, what I also kind of, I want to make sure I'm taking care of myself first and foremost. What I need to do is stay really focused on this path of like becoming the best version of myself so that when I am 35, 40, I'm a complete person to, and I can give all of myself to another person. Sometimes it can almost feel like a new relationship or somebody that you're spending a lot of time with can, can kind of take away from that grind. 
but it's not. It's not. I think that's very... I get in that mindset too, but it's simple-minded because realistically, you probably grow more with another person, with other people around you. I say this all the time. Life is a team sport. It really is, okay? You might be the coach, but you ain't the GM, all right? The forces that be are the GM, and they're picking the team around you, all right? Granted, you're the star. Don't get me wrong. You're, you're, the, you're the number one center. You are the quarterback. You're the fucking pitcher. I don't know. Just use whatever sports analogy you want. But you're the star. And you can, yeah, you can be like, hey, I don't really vesh with this guy. This doesn't work on the team. But at the end of the day, the GM brings in the players, a.k.a. life. And you got to mold out and you got you to gotta be a good team leader for everybody else around you. I hope this is making sense. I do love that term, though, love bombing. It's just, like, so extreme. It's like, yeah, my love for you is so powerful. It feels like someone bombing me. It feels almost like an explosion is you picking me up an iced coffee when I didn't ask you to. You're love bombing me. That's absolutely crazy. You almost get, like, too afraid to text somebody. You get, like, afraid to say, like, oh... Uh, she texted me. I shouldn't text back right away. I don't want to be, you know, seem too eager. Like, there's definitely a truth to making somebody kind of want it a little bit more when they shouldn't. But we limit ourselves and, like, we kind of almost shoot ourselves in the foot with this mindset of, of like, ah, don't seem too eager. Don't love bomb. Don't do this. Don't do that. Who cares? Hey, be yourself. And I know that's harder for most... I'm, I'm terrible at it, trust me. I go up and stage, I try... I'm a clown. I'm a clown for hire. Should I say is like... Whatever. Does this make any sense? Hold on, I'm going to check on this chicken. I have like the anxious attachment style, where it's like if I text or I leave a voice note and somebody doesn't respond right away, I will like just think about it if it's like past a couple hours and I'll just go... Ooh, maybe, maybe I did something, maybe I fucked something up. Uh, then you end up double texting, you send an extra voice note. Just compounds and stuff until you have an entire avalanche of you looking insecure. This chicken looks great. My love bombing also comes in a way where I... I, I hope it's not, like, manipulative. Maybe that's not the right word, but I, I feel as almost though like when I'm really committed to somebody or I'm really feeling them, I kind of, I'm willing to like really turn it all on, all the tricks, all the trades, like be the sweet boy, be the sweet little sucker baby, baby booyah that I need to be in order to get somebody on my team, but I don't know. I think we're all just really figuring it out. Dating is just really trash for people my age. You got to ask yourself, if there was more pressure to settle down and there were less options, would it be easier? Would you settle? Maybe I would just rather live like in a uh, Bahamian community down in the, the Caribbean or something where nobody could bother me. And then I would just sleep with people's wives as they came in for their cruises from Ohio. Imagine just a guy like me waiting, stalking out the harbor for the impractical Joker's cruise to come by. I scout out the best looking eight, eight and a half from Poughkeepsie, New York. And she's there with Doug and they haven't been getting along very well. Doug has been taking too much interest in his daughter's softball team. He's coaching the team. He's losing hair over it. And the parents aren't happy either. So they say, hey, Doug, let's get away. And he says, Mary, I can't get away now. We're about to go into Super Regionals. Mary says, listen, it's either the team or it's me. He says, all right. He relinquishes, relinquishes control. He's down there. The cruise hasn't been good. He doesn't even like Practical Jokers. Some of the comedians they brought on, they doesn't get it. He said he was guaranteed that Shane Gillis would be there 
and there's no Shane Gillis. So ultimately, they pull up in my port, a small Bahamian island. Maybe we call it uh, St. LaCroix. And I, I mean, I'm looking good. All right, I've been doing straight up tequila soda diet, nothing but washboard abs. And I say, hey, Doug, I'll tell you what, why don't you just take this bottle right here and go have some fun? I just put your name at the top of karaoke. He's got three songs. He plays Creep by Radiohead all three. Meanwhile, I'm just macking on Mary. And I said, hey, Mary, it's between you and me, but here's an extra room key. I'm in 321, the suite. Come on by. So love bombing. That's, I, maybe I got away from my point. Let's check on this chicken. I've been out of my routine this week. And as I'm sure many of you have a morning routine. You get up and you try and do the same couple things every day that kind of give you one inch closer to whatever your goal is. I'm a little bit rigid with mine. I'm trying, like, I go 7 a.m., wake up, walk my friend's dog, 7.30, journal, meditate. I write for about two hours. I edit for about two hours. And by 12, I can take a lunch, do some reading, and just kind of, like, relax, work out afterwards. That's kind of, like, the free time. But I've been getting up late. I don't know whether it's, like, summer or maybe I'm just sort of getting lazy, but... I really have to try and stop being hard on myself. I'm doing comedy full time. I'm so thankful for that. And I, and I want to take my glasses off and really say to everybody that has come out to a live show um, this, this past six months, you mean the world to me and, and I couldn't do it without you. And uh, I, would, I would walk, I'd run through the forest for all of you, to the highest of the mountains, to the lowest of valleys. So that's been good, but I have nothing lined up for the fall and winter, and it's kind of giving me a lot of anxiety. I won't lie to you. And career anxiety, I think we all just really want to, like, control everything and be like, this is what I'm going to do. Boom, boom, boom. I'm going to go and go. But when you take a step back, you have to just say, like, I have to just only be able to control what I can control. Okay, I'm not going to just be constantly killing it all the time. Some people have big old meteoric rises. Some people, they go up, they go down, they go up, they go down. I'm going to be doing probably this. Okay, slowly getting better every day. Stacking up days, pal. Joe Biden dropped out of the presidential race. Aren't we all glad that we uh, bullied that old man into running for president and then we bullied him even harder to drop out? Wasn't that a nice thing to do? I mean, realistically, Joe Biden, he's a good guy. I just, like, I felt bad. It didn't, and I can sit up here and, like, people will probably listen to me and be like, oh, white guy defending the other white guy. It's like, I don't know, man. He just reminds me of my, uh, of like my grandfather, or like other old nice people that I know. And it's just kind of unfortunate, everything that's happened to him. Like, people don't really know about Joe Biden's life. Like, the guy had like a wife and son killed in a car accident. He had another son, like, died of cancer. And then Hunter, and then he has Hunter. And then on top of that, we're like, Joe, why are you fucking up the presidency? Like, gee whiz, let's just like, I don't want to be an apologist, but maybe I will be a stan. Then we'll have Kamala Harris maybe be our presidential nominee against Trump. And um, yeah, I don't know, man. I, I just think like the Trump assassination changed everything because it just... It just shows that, like, we're not a serious country anymore. Like, political violence, that, that happens in, like, you know, it's not, it's not serious country stuff, dude. Really, all right? That's, like, shit people do. Like, I, I'm reading this book right now about, like, El Salvador, and they talk about Oscar Romero, the, the priest who was uh, 
assassinated over uh, his views against the El, Salvador, El, El Salvadorian dictatorship. And like that's that's what we we're just like we're gonna re, we're resorting to violence because we can't fucking see it. It's so sad, dude. It just shows we're not like to be taken seriously. But I don't know, man. I don't really want to talk politics, to be honest with you, because I felt like I did that the other day with the girl that I'm dating, and she was like, wow, you know, I really don't like when uh, guys talk politics at me. And I go, yeah, that's totally fair. I have a lot of career anxiety at the moment. I'm wondering if I'm where I should be, if I'm doing the right things all the time. You know, I'm 27, so it's this is around that time when... You kind of have to make the big leap for it. My buddy Turner just made the big leap. He uh, he finally like quit and stopped doing any sort of like corporate desk life, you know, tech sales. And now he's just started his own gym space and he's doing what he's passionate about. You know, I made the probably the big leap last year and made stand-up comedy my full-time job, which is I'm you know I'm super thankful for. But now you just keep wondering what's next. And it's it's very hard to feel very content when you are constantly moving the goalpost. Something that I heard the other day on sports radio might actually like resonate with us. It's, it's, uh, the quote is, it's not about who gets there first. It's about who stays the longest. That's kind of a nice thing, isn't it? Things are good, man. I I feel like I always get into some sort of a relationship during the summertime. I don't know what it is, man. I'm a summertime lover. Guy like me? Oh, man, I love a beach date. There's something about, like, getting a bag of Cape Cod potato chips, finding that old canister of sunblock that's all... The gunk is all piled up with the spray, a beach towel, and you say to your lady, you go, hey... Let's get in the water. Let's get in the fucking water. You know what my go-to move is? I don't know if any of the lads can uh, know about this one. The minute I get there, if I don't have a chair, I usually don't bring a chair. But what I'll do is I'll get down like a dog and I'll just kind of like go to the sand and I'll, and I'll, dig, this, and I'll dig the sand out kind of like that. And then what happens is you get yourself a nice hole right there in which you can um, sit in. Uh, it's pretty nice. That's kind of my go-to move. I mean, you do it with a girl and she'll think that you are a psycho, but definitely worth it. Because then you go, uh, you don't have a chair now. I, I have a chair in the sand. Dummy. I just, I don't know. I, I am enjoying the summer and I... It's very hard during the summer to feel like you are being productive because it's such a... Like, my mindset is still lined up with the seasons of school. To me, summertime is about vacation. So when my body is telling me, stop doing anything, my brain is saying, Alec, you have to complete work. You have to still be productive. You are an adult. But my brain is saying, who cares? All I have to do is show up for my... Uh, dishwashing shift all you have to do is caddy on the weekends and make a couple extra bucks so that way you can use your fake ID down at the Kanoko station and hit the beach with the fellas it's it's, it's such a, a, a give and take and, and I think it's really contributing to like how anxious I feel uh, about my career and just like about how things are going because I really I have a lot less anxiety when I, I'm getting things done every day. When I'm just like, boom, wrote, boom, edited, boom, worked out, boom. And it's just, I don't have to think. When you don't have to think, you're a lot happier. That's why stupid people are pretty stoked all the time. All right, they're just like, Kenny Chesney, jack my shit. <laughs> uh, but if I'm not productive, I feel like kind of a big old waste of bag. Looks pretty good. I'll tell you what I think is going to be a big uh, debate coming up in the next 
like at the end, towards the end of this election cycle, is going to be immigration. Uh, Kamala seems pretty tough on immigration, but also, you know, you got Trump being like he's going to deport everybody. Who needs that? Breaking up families that are like pretty much fleeing. Prosecute like I don't know. I'm reading this book right now about kind of like the origins of all of our immigration problems here in the United States. Spoiler alert, it's our fault, okay? All we've done for the past half century is just prop up regimes in Central American countries like Honduras, El Salvador, and Nicaragua, and Guatemala that serve our interests while they commit horrible human rights abuses and practically genocide. The Mayan population of Guatemala pretty much decimated under the rulers that they had. So they all come up here to the United States. And like all of this was like, as the, as the situation was building in like the, the 80s and 90s, we really like then started kind of like putting the microscope on illegal immigration. We, we kept thinking like, oh, it's Mexicans. It's like mostly South, it's like Central Americans. And it's our fault. Like MS-13, we created MS-13. Okay? And now we sit up here and we're like, let's deport them all back. They're going to come back. They're going to come back. I like papooses. Okay? What we really need is an immigration policy. Is we need a way to legalize everybody who's already here, stronger border patrols, and a genuine system for political and asylum. That gets people through. It's not hard. I mean, but in practice, of course, that it's extremely difficult. But, you know, I'm reading the book now, and it's it's pretty interesting to just hear about just the trauma these people have leaving countries where they've been like, you know, they were marked for murder pretty much. And then they come here, and they just have to deal with it. They have to immediately start working. They don't make any money, and they're constantly feared of being deported back. Because if they apply for legal citizenship, usually with the United States, this was like, again, during the 80s and 70s, the United States would find out, notify Nicaraguan, El Salvadorian government. Government would be like, yeah, send him back. Send him back. Guy gets murdered. You know, it's just like this shit happens. And it's bad. So I'm really interested to hear what Kamala Harris has to say about that. I am. Like, I'm genuinely. I'm not even making a joke. I would like to hear like something actually comprehensive because we could use a better border. You know what I think? Here's my proposition. What I would actually like to see is all the big cities along like the US Mexico border, El Paso, San Diego, um, the ones in like I'd like to see it just become like a gray zone, like a homogenous area where we just see the blending of US and Latin American cultures together and it's kind of like a free zone we just you know like they have their own it's like a sort of they're all city states as opposed to um, part of either Mexico or America I would like to see that that'd be kind of interesting to see because I think about like you know just the way we decimated all like the Native American culture in this country with manifest destiny and I think about now I'm like man do we really need like you know rapid city South Dakota wouldn't have, that, wouldn't have that been nice if, like, all these beautiful places in, like, Idaho or Montana were actually, like, these bastions of Native American culture instead of what they are today? And what they are today is fine, but you know what I mean. If we actually had, like, some real diversity that comes from, like, with, like thousands of years of, of, of built-up culture and, and, and late ways of life. Just a thought, but anyway... All right, I think this chicken looks about done. Guys, that'll be the uh, the end of the Big Al's Grilling ASMR episode two. If you like this podcast, I would implore you to uh, rate, subscribe, and uh, tell a friend. Because I think we'll have a, a bunch of more guests and we'll have a lot more fun stuff to be, do, to be doing, to do. So, um, yeah, can't wait to talk to you soon. Bye. Yeah. <laughs>